the honour of opening up the very first sermon for our MAGA series. It's finally here. We are finally talking about it. Make Australia godly again. Make America great again. However you want to do it. It's honestly, it's a, there's a lot of, lot of things. It's multifaceted. So whatever you want to call it. But if you don't know, if you haven't been here for the past few weeks, maybe you saw it's our MAGA series online. Somehow you got out of the shadow band social media Nazism and you saw our posts on MAGA and you're here. We actually covered for the past few weeks. We've been really... God has been guiding what sermons we're doing and what series we're doing. And we just landed with a brand new era series where we've been talking about revival. And if you're in crew last week as well, our crew studies kind of pulled apart how every single time we have revival, straight after what you will see is the church, the spiritual awakening that happens in the church always leads to some sort of social shift. And by social shift, that also is a political shift. You'll start to see things things change in the world. In fact, we've seen like a revival in the opposite way. And as a result, the demonic ideologies have been taking over our government in every way, shape and form. So we are intentionally doing this after this series. We're talking about what God has to say about all things politics, understanding that as we talk about these issues, that God isn't just going to make Australia great again. He's going to make Australia godly again. So we're very intentional about the name and the placement of this series, but maybe if you know our, um, I guess our pers- part of our personality as a church is we kind of like to talk about politics, in case it's not obvious. But the reason we like to talk about politics, because there might be some of you in the room that you kind of came in, it's your first time, you didn't really know that there was a politics series, and you're like, look, if I'm honest, I'm one of those people that'll say the church shouldn't really get involved. Like, politics is politics. Can we just talk about Jesus? Can we just do the Bible stuff? Why do we have to get political? Why are you up there talking about a political idea? Well, what I would say to those people, and I know there's probably not very many in the room, but this is going up online, and I know that there are going to be some trolls listening to this. So let's just get that out there for a second. Why is it that the church needs to talk about politics? Well, in case it's not obvious, and if you've been asleep for the past five years, politics has gotten itself involved in the church. Not just the church, in you and your Christianity, in the way you raise your children, in every area possible. So let's pull it apart a little bit. Everyone remember the COVID scam? Yep, you were there for that. Everyone was there for that. We were all here in Australia, especially. We felt it real bad. But around the world, they were like, you guys are crazy. Australia is crazy. The government quite literally told the church how they should have church what church is, whether it's essential or not essential, crazy, Um, what you can do in church, who you can allow to come to your church building, who can stand on a platform and preach to the congregation. The government somehow dictated how we can do church, in what way we can do church. Okay, one week, yes, you can sing in church, but as long as you have a mask on and you can pray in church as long as you have a mask on and you can't come to church unless you're vaccinated. You can be in church if you are vaccinated. Did you know that the government said that anybody that stood on a platform in a church had to be vaccinated? That is a thing. Australia said that. Crazy. Americans are like, that is wild. That would not happen in other countries, but it happened here. But In many ways, it didn't just happen in the four walls of the church. We saw that pretty aggressively with COVID, but the government or politics in general has not just found its way inside the four walls, it's also found its way outside. In in one way, the government has told you how you should be raising your kids. In fact, they've inserted themselves into the curriculum and you are mandated as a human that lives in this country to teach your child this curriculum unless you homeschooled. God bless the homeschool mums. They're coming for you eventually, don't you worry. Enjoy it while it lasts. But in every way, shape or form, marriage, you know, once upon a time, marriage was a sacred religious practice. Now it's like a government piece of paper thing. You know, we as a church have to follow some sort of government regulation in order to marry people legally in this country. It is crazy. So the government has gotten itself involved. Politics has gotten involved in every area that you try to profess your Christianity. And so... Because the government decided to get itself involved in my Christianity and the way we do church, I think that it is fitting for the church to actually start to get involved in politics. Once upon a time, Christianity 
was illegal. Talk about like oppression. Once upon a time, Christianity was illegal. And the only way that changed was because someone in power in politics was radically converted, saw a vision of Jesus and ended up saying, everybody now we're all gonna become Christian. That is why the reason that the Western world is Christian is because of politics. Something happened in the political sphere. So we speak to politics. We are very intentional about it. But you know that uh, it's not just um, the government that are imposing all of this and the entire world. For some reason, it's okay for everybody else that has influence to talk about politics, but it's not okay for the church to do it. What's one example? And specifically this morning or this evening, sorry, we're going to be talking about one issue in particular a very polarizing topic. And it's gonna be very heavy for us to hear this evening. I'll just let you know, get God to prepare your heart. But one of the biggest issues, and if anybody watched the debate last week, this is one of the issues that I believe that Trump kind of flopped in the debate, if you know what I mean. And that is the issue of abortion. So that's what we're gonna talk about this evening. And we're gonna go, and I've preached this a few times. We've spoken about abortion quite a few times in church and we've tackled it from a biological point of view, a philosophical point of view, a biblical point of view. And we've covered a lot of different areas. But the reason that we talk about this is because in case it's not obvious, if you watch the campaign, you would have noticed Kamala seemed to be a little bit shy in the beginning, a little bit timid, stumbling over her words, not really moving very much. And it was like, like, okay, this is going to be interesting. But then as soon as the question of abortion came up, all of a sudden she came out of her shell and she was a new woman and this passion came over her. And it is like so obvious that this woman loves abortion. Doesn't just tolerate it and want women's rights or whatever they like to call it. It's so obvious that she loves abortion. She came out and started to get passionate about this topic. And this is kind of when things went downhill for Donald Trump. But the reason that Kamala talks about this so uh, freely and with so much joy is because really when you look at it, and this is, I know, American politics, but it makes its way in this country. Don't even get me started on that. Why do you care so much about American politics? I'm like, you know how COVID was like kind of bad when Trump was in? You know how it got like 10 times worse when Biden came in? What happens in the US affects this country. So don't be living under a rock to think that what happens there doesn't affect here. Anyways, when we look at the US election, especially, which is happening in like less than two months, crazy, very exciting. But when you look at what's happening, the um, Democratic campaign, there is one issue that they really like trying to push forward like a bulldozer into the world. And that is the issue of abortion. In fact, Kamala, the lady who was quite literally running to lead the entire country of the United States, terrifying. The fact that this woman could potentially speaking to men like Putin is wild to me. Like, keep her away from everyone, please. Yes, but one of the biggest things that um, Kamala, I guess, has in her reputation and she, is she's very big on what's so-called women's rights. What I like to say is just say it for what it is. She loves abortion. And in fact, she is one of the most pro-abortion um, running mates for presidency that we've ever had. More than Hillary Clinton. This woman is crazy. How do we know this? Well, she is in favour of terminating pregnancy up until like full term, nine months. Not only that, she actually actually voted against a bill that was reinstated or put in place in the US that said that if a baby is born alive in the third trimester, because they have to give birth to a dead baby, if the baby is born alive, they shouldn't give life-saving care to the unborn baby or the now born baby. She voted against this. No, we shouldn't give life-saving care to a baby that is now outside of the womb insanely demonic. So she loves abortion. She's very pro-abortion. And it's not just the um, politicians that are talking about this kind of stuff while the church is silent. You know who's talking about it? All of the celebrities that your kids listen to. All of the influences that they're watching as they scroll on social media all day after school. In fact, their friends are talking about it. It's in the TV shows that they're watching. Their school, if they go to school, is most likely talking about it as well. Your children are being bombarded with this ideology and the church should just be silent about abortion, right? Just talk about Jesus. 
What's one example? Well, let's take a look at Taylor Swift. Any Taylor Swift fans in the house? No. Actually, before we get Taylor Swift, can we pull up that graph? This is so interesting. So look at the voter base, or I guess the biggest demographic, it says it up here. Unmarried women are the primary voting demographic for the Democratic Party. Look at this, it's crazy. Let me move out of the way so you can see. If you see over here, out of the Democrats, the demographic that vote for Democrats, most of them, 68% of them are unmarried women. So this is, the, this is the people that they are trying to win the votes for. This is the people that they're really trying to push. Most of their voter base is unmarried women. So what do unmarried women stand for that are very far left? Well, they love abortion and they'll call it women's rights. And one of those unmarried women is, you guessed it, Taylor Swift. Look at what she said. This week she finally came out of her shell and we all know that she's very pro-abortion and pro-LGBTQ and everything that God is not. If you watch her documentary, she says, I'm a Christian and we stand for love. And so I want LGBTQ rights and abortion on demand. Crazy delusional, it's fine. Celebrities most of the time are. But she actually posted that she was endorsing Kamala Harris and specifically for these reasons. She says, this is where my vote is going, who has been standing up for LGBTQ rights, IVF and a woman's right to her own body for decades. And now, I don't know if you guys have noticed the photo that she chose to put up doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the caption, but it very much does. The idea of being an unmarried woman is that you are single, you're alone, and you have all of your cats and no children to look after. So what she's posting is she's like, yep, I'm a independent woman, me and all of my cats. No kids to feed, no man to serve, just me and my cats. This is like the brand of Taylor Swift. Crazy. But this is the people that you're young daughters most likely are listening to. Another one is Olivia Rodrigo. She had a concert a few months ago and what she decided to do, which she ended up getting in legal trouble for, for obvious reasons, she set up this trailer outside the front of her concerts and they were handing out morning after pills to their audience members, some of which were minors. They were underage girls who were listening to this pop sensations songs. And she very much is a big advocate for abortion, talks about it in her concerts, out of her concerts. These are the voices that the young generation are listening to. But you'll still get some uptight Christians that'll say church and get involved in politics. Why echo church do you guys so political? Well, one of the biggest things, like we're talking about abortion, and by the end of this, you will understand exactly why it is that we talk about this. Because if the church doesn't speak about this, who is? Like on the side of what is morally right, who is going to talk about this? Are we going to leave it up to the secular world? Are we going to leave it up, just hope that there are some conservatives that align with the Bible that are outside of the church? Are we going to leave the fight to the world? No way. We as a church, have decided we're going to speak and we're going to stand up for what God says is right or wrong. And so abortion, that's what we decided to focus on. And instead of kind of before we go into the big philosophical and biblical idea of what this issue is, let's just look at the stats. Can we agree on that? Because for many of us, you don't even know the reality of actually what is happening out there. You know, okay, yeah, I agree murder is wrong, but you know most of the world actually agrees murder is wrong, even non-Christians that don't claim to believe in God, um, that claim, sorry, to not believe in God. So we understand this idea a little bit, but we're going to look at the depth of it, the stats that we're looking at. And I looked at this two years ago when I preached on this the last time and I was reading through my notes from last two, the two years prior and I was like, whoa, the stats are dramatically different. So two years ago when I read out these stats, worldwide there were 40 to 50 million abortions per year. You know what it is now? 73 million. And this is after the overturning of Roe v. Wade in America, which makes it harder for you to kill your baby, praise God. But this 73 million stat worldwide, to put it into perspective for you, out of all pregnancies that exist, it's 29%. 29% of all women that get pregnant, 29% of them end up terminating their baby. If you look at all unplanned pregnancies, it's 69% 
of all unplanned pregnancies that exist, you didn't mean to do it, it just happened, 69% of them end up choosing to kill their baby in the womb. And so this is the terrifying stat, but we look at this and it's quite um, traumatising and it's quite big. But if you look at it in comparison to what the world looks at as one of the scariest and craziest events in history that were so tragic and we have days where we um, commemorate them. When you look at it, a lot of people don't like it when I use the term Holocaust when it comes to abortion. I say abortion is the modern day Holocaust and I stand by that, I always will. The reason I say that is because when you look at the Holocaust, cost a tragic event in history. Six million Jews were killed in that time, in the Holocaust. Six million. We understand that's such a tragedy. This was the extermination of a people. Insane. We understand the weight of that even as Christians. It's a spiritual war. Six million. If we look out a little bit, zoom in a little bit earlier to World War One. you know, in World War One, it lasted about four years. 20 million people worldwide were killed. And we're like, yeah, war is terrible. So many people die and it's such a tragedy. But then we come to the stat about abortion per year. 73 million babies. Not adults who have done some terrible things and they might have deserved it. No, babies in the womb, 73 million. This stat is like incomparable to anything else. In fact, this is the modern day genocide of our time. And we say this all the time. It's the most evil act that happens in my opinion and honestly in God's opinion. One of the most evil acts that is happening in our time and the church is saying, don't speak about it. Don't talk about it. I know Taylor Swift is going on about it and she's advocating for evil. I know Olivia Rodrigo. I know every single celebrity, some that even claim to be Christian. Hailey Bieber loves abortion. Justin Bieber, who her husband, who quite literally was the result of his mother, who is pro-life, saying, I'm going to choose to keep my baby. A young woman alone looked after her baby herself. So we have crazy idiot celebrities advocating for pro-abortion, kill your baby, and then you have pastors who are saying, no, we should um, leave that to the world, only talk about Jesus. We're not going to do that in Echo Church. Amen. (laughs) Amen indeed. So... How did we get here? 73 million, how did we get here? Yes, the world needs revival, we covered that. But when you look at it, it's really interesting because if you look at all cultures across time and space, most people, in fact, I would say very, every single person, except for like a very rare few who are most likely psychopaths or just demon possessed, probably the same thing. But when you look at it across history, time, different cultures, there is a universal understanding that murder is wrong. In fact, even the most evil people, when you look at it, they will be anti-murder to some degree. You know, yeah, you can kill everyone else, just don't kill my child. Kill everyone else, but don't kill the ones that I love. Why is that? Well, because we have a universal understanding, murder is wrong. And so I don't know if you've noticed, the argument here when it comes to the abortion stand isn't whether or not murder should be legal or illegal. We all kind of agree murder should be against the law. Amen. Good. We're in the right church. But for the most part, this is not what the argument is. In fact, one of the biggest questions that we have is, is abortion murder? When does life begin? So it's not whether or not murder should be legal, it's whether or not abortion is murder. And so I kind of wanna look at this, zoom in a little bit, look at the root issue. Everybody believes murder is wrong. Why is that? Well, let's ask that question. Why is murder wrong? Why is murder wrong? Well, yeah, you might be like, when the Bible says so, you know. No, let's go a little bit deeper philosophically, biblically as well, don't worry. Why is murder wrong? What it comes down to is this idea of what's known as the sanctity of life. The sanctity of life. Life is sacred. Now, as Christians, we understand that because we have a biblical worldview. Not only does the Bible talk about do not murder, and it's made very simple for us. When you look out at the bigger picture, we understand even the first two pages of the Bible, the first chapter of the Bible talks about this issue that human life is sacred. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. Newsflash, the only reason you have value, I know you think you're very special, but the only reason you have value as a human being is because you're made in God's image. That is the only reason. Demi Lovato, I know you're perfect the way you are. No, you're not. But you are valuable only because of God. Nothing that you do. 
You are valuable because you're made in the image of God. That is the only reason you have value. It's got nothing to do with you and what you do. And so we understand this from a biblical perspective, but the world understands this too. How do you know that? How does the world understand that life is sacred, it has value? Well, think about it. If you drive on the way to work, you're on the highway and you see on the side of the road, roadkill. A kangaroo has been hit by a car. You look at it and you're like, oh, doesn't really strike much concern in you, right? You see it, you understand it, it's tragedy, get over it, you move on. No one really cares unless you're a crazy vegan. And even then, you're not gonna do anything about it. You're not gonna call anyone, don't act righteous. But when you are driving to work and on the side of the road, you see in front of you an accident that looks fatal. All of a sudden you start slowing down and you look over and you see and you get some concern, your heart beats and you utter these words, oh my gosh, I hope everyone is okay. Even non-Christians, this is not exclusive to Christians. We understand that human life has value. And the reason human life has value is because you reflect the sacred image of God. And so we understand life has value. It is sacred, this idea of the sanctity of life. But really when you look at this, C.S. Lewis uses this analogy because like I said, non-Christians know it too. How do non-Christians have the capacity to be kind, to love? Well, yes, because they're made in the image of God. But C.S. Lewis kind of explains this in the analogy of a soccer game, right? The idea behind morality, in order for there to be a sense of right and wrong, there is a universal understanding that a right and wrong exists. It's almost as though there is a moral law that lives inside every single human being and their conscience knows what is evil and what is not evil, what is good, what is bad. And so C.S. Lewis uses this analogy of a soccer game. Any soccer fans in the house? A few. I hate sport. Sorry. But I understand to any sport, there are rules. And so what C.S. Lewis says, he says that two soccer players aren't going to argue over whether one player committed a foul or not unless there was an understanding that there are rules to the game of soccer. True? True. Why would you argue, yes, you committed a foul. What's a foul? Who created that rule? There is a a universal understanding that there are rules to the game soccer and soccer players, when they're engaging in it, understand this is a foul because I understand the rules. In the same way, when you look at morality and the idea of our world, good and evil, we understand the fact that we argue over it. The fact that we're even having conversations of what is good and what is evil proves that there is a universal understanding and that there is an objective idea of good and evil. It is in the hearts of every single person, Christian or not a Christian, because we are all made in the image of God. Not just Christians are made in God's image. And so this understanding kind of gives us a little bit of a clue into why we think that life is sacred. It is on the hearts of every single individual. In fact, look at how the Bible says it in Romans chapter 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the Lord requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts excuse or even excuse them. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying Gentiles, those who do not know the law. And to give you some context, the Jews obviously were taught had to be sitting under the law every single day. They were taught it by their parents, by their rabbis. They understood the law written down what God has said, the right and the wrong. But what Paul is saying here, he's saying even Gentiles know the law. They, they do the law, sorry. Even though they don't know it, they do the law. And then he uses this phrase, by nature. They do the law by nature. Even though they don't know it, nobody's told them what is right and what is wrong. They do it by nature. And what this is talking about is this was an idea thought up by a medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas. And he came up with this idea. We know it as the natural law theory. The natural law theory. What does this mean? Well, what his idea was that, yes, there is a moral law. Everybody has a conscience. We all know what's right or wrong. But the idea behind this is, We have a moral law, but the moral law is governed by an eternal law. There is something out there that is the rule giver, the rule maker. This is an eternal law that is in the fabric of everything that exists. And the moral law comes from that, but doesn't just stop there. 
it can, he continues by adding that the moral law is reflected in the law of nature. What does this mean? Well, how do you know if something is morally right or morally wrong? Look at nature. Does it conflict with nature or does it align with nature? What's one example? A good analogy, homosexuality. Is homosexuality moral? No. Why is it not moral? Well, because when you look at the idea of sexuality, a sexual act is there by nature. You don't decide this. It just happens. Your body works a certain way. God designed it sovereignly. By nature, sex is there to procreate. The act of sex brings procreation and homosexuality cannot procreate. A homosexual act cannot produce procreation. Therefore, by nature, nature will tell you it is not moral. And so this is just one example that we can see. And when you look at the idea of life and the sanctity of life, nature will tell you that life is sacred. Life is sacred. If you don't believe me, think about it. One analogy given, this is the the law of self-preservation, right? The biological law of self-preservation. When you look at this, a dandelion, for example, anyone had those pesky things in your backyard? Yeah, we get a lot of them. If anybody knows how to weed, come and see me afterwards because we need to do some intense weeding in our backyard. But uh, dandelions are a weed, right? They grow. Everybody knows that when you see one dandelion in your backyard, it's not long before there is multiple in your backyard. Why is that? Well, because all it takes is for your toddler to waddle in the backyard, pick up something that looks so cute and fluffy, blow it and watch it go into the wind and then all of a sudden you know in a couple weeks time you're going to see them everywhere in your backyard. Why is that? Well, the way that nature is designed is that a dandelion was quite literally created with the idea of we need to multiply in order to have self-preservation. In order for the survival of the species, we need to outgrow the death that may happen. So if one dandelion dies, it is pulled up from the root, it's okay because the seed are made by the multiple, not just one or two. There are multiple seeds that is going to scatter and though one dies, it's okay because hundreds more are going to come. This is the idea of the biological biological law of self-preservation. Where there is one, there is going to be multiple in order for the species to survive. Pretty impressive. Dandelions are pretty cool. God designed it pretty sovereignly. But that may be impressive, but it's not as impressive as the human species. Now let's just do a little bit of sex ed. Are you guys okay with that? It's not going to be as awkward as when you spoke to your parents or when your teacher was doing it to you, so don't you worry. What's really interesting is a fertile female produces one egg per month. Now that's not very impressive. You're like, one egg, whoa. Like not as good as a dandelion, obviously. Yeah, it's not that impressive. But what is impressive is a male in one ejaculation produces 30 million to 60 million sperm. That's a lot, 30 million to 60 million sperm. And if one of those sperm implants into the egg, you have fertilization. You have the beginning of a growing, living baby. And so when you look at this, you take a step back and you're like, oh, um, it's almost as if the species was created to multiply and to self-preserve. It's almost like God has designed human beings in this act of sex to multiply and to ensure the survival of the species. It's almost like nature tells us that life is sacred. Why did God design for your stomach to grumble when you're hungry? To let you know, hey, I need food in order to live another day. Why do you get thirsty and you start panting and you can't think because you just need water? Because your body is telling you, hey, I need to live another day. Even people that are suicidal still hunger. Their body by nature is saying, I need to live another day. God has designed you. Nature tells you that life is sacred. Whether it's abortion or not, factually speaking, nature tells you life is sacred. So okay, we understand the law is in the hearts of every single person. God has quite literally made human beings on the inside of them. Something tells them what is good, what is evil. Our instinct, to be honest, outside of the Spirit of God is to act beyond that, is to act away from what is good. But we all understand there's a good and an evil and we understand nature tells us, morality tells us that life is sacred. But then the question comes, okay, 
if life is sacred and if nature tells us the good and the evil, then does abortion actually end a life? In other words, when does life begin? Now, this is a really interesting question because I find that the feminists or the crazy abortionists will use this question to kind of pretend it's a curveball when I'm like, science literally uh, goes against everything that you're saying. Science has answered that question ages ago. You know, the follow the science guys. When it comes to this, they don't exactly do it. It's interesting because science will tell you, and I only looked into this. To be honest, I hate that stuff. It goes over my head. But I looked into this just because I'm passionate about this subject. Have you heard of a process known as gametogenesis? Big word, let me teach it to you. Probably won't do as well as Pastor Millie would. She's so good with this stuff. But gametogenesis pretty much is a system or it's a process that happens when the fertilization happens. What happens is sperm meets egg, implants into egg, starts the fertilization period. What happens is the DNA from the sperm splits into two cells and the DNA from the egg splits into two cells. And then those two halves join together and make a separate DNA. You know what science tells you? that this is a new life that is outside of the life of the sperm and the egg. This is quite literally a new DNA, which means this is a new life. This is at fertilization. The first thing that happens, it happens in an instant. This is crazy. So science would beg to differ with the idea of life doesn't start at conception. A baby in the womb isn't a life. We could go into this debate for hours. But I find that the reason that they do this is because we've understood everybody knows right or wrong. It's just that those who deny it long enough, they end up living in their own delusion. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Have you ever spoken to someone who has lied so many times that you can see they actually believe their own lies. They actually don't even understand what reality is anymore. That is the state of our world at the moment. That the same women who are crying justice and a voice to the oppressed are the ones that are quite literally killing the voiceless. They are killing those who have no voice. And what the feminists, and I say feminists because you can't talk about abortion without joining it with feminism. The whole abortion debate in politics started as back as, as early as first wave feminism. If you didn't know, the first wave feminist, anybody read the book Frankenstein? Mary Shelley, she wrote that book. She was one of the first wave feminists of the 1800s. Her mother actually wrote a whole um, uh, transcript or book or whatever it was about women's rights. And she was one of the early feminists. And they were actually raised, Mary Shelley's mother was actually raised by a member of the free love movement. If you don't know what that is, pretty much it was an idea in a Christian Christian society that lives by Christian traditions and morals, we want to abandon the Christian idea of marriage and sexuality. So we should be able to sleep with whoever we want. We should be able to sleep outside of marriage if we want, and we shouldn't have any restrictions or rules. Free love, free love, no restrictions, free love. So the early feminists actually were part of this. And one of the early feminists, Mary Shelley, she was one of the women that paved the way. What they would do is because women started to work and started to get independence from their husbands, she was influenced by her father and husband to do this, by the way. The whole idea was, well, I want to be able to um, do what I want and not be bound by the idea of having a child because once I have a child, well, then I'm going to have to stay home and look after this child. Didn't have education, public education back then. And so she was bound to the home. So what they would do is, well, let's just protest and not have sex with our husbands anymore. We, we don't want to have babies. And remember, abortion wasn't around here. They didn't have birth control here. So the only form of birth control is abstinence. I'm just going to not give my husband what he wants. I'm closed for service. I don't want to have babies in order to be independent from him. This idea is so demonic and it happened in early feminism. So this is where this idea kind of started in culture. So that's why when I say the feminist, that's what I'm talking about. You won't find somebody that's pro-abortion that's also not a self-proclaimed feminist. It is what it is. Feminists, you can talk to me after. Let's have a real good chat. Trust me, I know my stuff. It's so fun to argue with feminists. I love it. Anyway, abortion and feminism is my two favorite things to talk about in case it's not obvious. But this whole, what was I talking about? Let me get back to my notes. Oh yes, culture is so delusional. Culture is so delusional. Women have in the, in the idea, in their head, they believe that they are fighting for the oppressed women instead of unborn babies. They believe that they are fighting for justice, but while they are doing that, they're actually abandoning nature. 
They're abandoning nature in two ways. Number one, they're abandoning the natural law that sex produces children. No, that's oppressive. Sex producing children, that's oppressive. Think about it. Would you go up to a apple tree and watch it and wait and be like, there are no oranges, this is unfair. This is so unfair. Why is this apple tree not producing oranges? Oranges. I have a right to have an orange when I want an orange. Why is this tree not producing apples? What a ridiculous idea. But you know, they do the exact thing. They say reproductive rights. Hey, no one is telling you that you can or can't have sex. We're just telling you when the natural cycle that, you know, sex creates babies, when that does happen, just don't kill your baby. That's what we're telling you. So no one's telling you you don't have a right to reproduce. In fact, we're telling you that you should reproduce if you want to have sex. So it's a play on words here, but this is the delusion of our society is they are acting against the natural law. And you know what Kamala Harris uses? She uses the term morality when she talks about abortion. This is how delusional it is. So you are telling me that you are not only denying the sanctity of life, that life is sacred. You should be able to kill someone if you want to kill them. Not only that, but you're also saying that the idea that sex makes babies is injustice. It is oppressive for me to have the consequences of my actions. This is how delusional our world is. And in the debate, Kamala Harris literally said this idea to um, uh, eliminate or to hold women against the freedom to be able to kill their child is, quote, immoral. Immoral. Did anybody hear her say that? Now, that was the only thing really that I got out of that debate, that Kamala Harris thinks that denying women the right to kill their baby is an immoral thing. This is how delusional that you get. The further away from God's truth, the further away from nature you get, as you start celebrating um, homosexuality because you're celebrating something that's against nature, of course you're gonna land at killing babies in the womb because you've already abandoned your moral compass. You've already abandoned the fact that morality is reflected in nature. And so this is how delusional our world is. And look at what R.C. Sproul says about the women of our time. He says, humanity his greatest enemy in the cycle of nature's law of self-preservation and survival is humanity itself. Very interesting. So as nature is quite literally ensuring the survival of the species, the species itself is killing them off. That is the ultimate form of delusion. Like that's the only word that I can describe is delusion. We are the source of our own demise. Women, you are the source of your own demise. If you believe the lies of feminism and the pro-abortion politicians, we are, you are not a victim. In fact, you are actually the villain in this case when you think about it. I know it's not nice to say, but it's true. Sometimes women are not the victim. Sometimes you are knowingly killing your baby out of convenience. It is an evil act. So what we have to conclude from all of this is that Killing a baby is immoral. Therefore, it is the ultimate form of evil. We have to say these words, abortion is evil. It's not moral, Kamala Harris. She'd never hear this, but I so wish I could have a conversation with this woman. So culture is delusional. So nature tells you that life is sacred, but did you know that the Bible says it too? Yes, I know you're made in the image of God. We covered that, but actually very explicitly says that the um, idea of life itself is, quote, sacred. Look at Jeremiah chapter one. This is what we know as the biggest abortion um, verse that we use, right? It's the one we all know. Before you were formed, I knew you. Let's read it. Let's read it. It says this, Jeremiah chapter one, verse four, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So Jeremiah says that God called him when he was in the womb, in the womb. Now this is pretty common sense. Like we know this, we've read this. This actually gets a little bit deeper when you look at the other thing that God says. He says, before you were born, before you came out of your mother's womb, before you were born, I set you apart. Now this word set apart, if you're paying attention in church, we've spoken about this word set apart. It's the same word used for holy. It's the same word used for consecrated. And if you look at the Hebrew word, you'll see what this actually means. The word consecrated or set apart means to make sacred. 
To make sacred. Do you know where we get the word sanctity from? Sacred. This literally, God is saying, life in the womb is sacred. I set you apart. I made you sacred before you were even born. God Himself explicitly says, life inside the womb is sacred. It is holy. It belongs to Him. What's interesting is I didn't do this this morning because I didn't think I'd have time, but we can go a little bit longer tonight. Look at what this says. This is a book. Latonia actually sent this to me a couple years ago, and I was like, this is insane. So this um, author wrote about, I think it's called Raising Boys or something. I've never actually read the book, but look at what he received a um, letter from a physician. Look at what he says. He says, Dear Dr. Dobson, while reading Augustine's Confessions recently, I came across an abject, the adjective sacral when he used it in reference to something holy or sacred. Being a physician, we in the profession know the word sacrum to identify a bone in the lower spine or pelvis. As a Christian, I wondered if there had been some divine influence or inspiration placed upon the ancient anatomists who were bestowing names of various body parts in the skeleton. That led me to do a bit of research in the possible association of theology and anatomy where this particular bone is concerned. It was quite providential, I believe, that the portion of the human anatomy which stands guard over the birth canal in the female is also in Latin called theos sacrum, literally meaning holy or sacred bone. That is insane. The bone, the area, and I, like, I'm not an anatomist, so I can't you know, say it, but I'm just reading the, what the physician said. He's saying the bone that guards the birth canal in the female is literally called something that is holy or sacred. It protects what is holy or sacred. Nature tells us life is sacred in the womb and out of the womb. You cannot argue with this, but the Delusional feminists always will. And so we, the question that we come to is, okay, murder is wrong, life is sacred, we understand, but is abortion murder? Is life in the womb? We've kind of covered that, yes, it is from a biblical point of view, but just for like the people that care about biology and facts and science, if gametogenesis didn't convince you, I thought that it would be good to kind of look at what is actually happening inside of a womb, specifically the first trimester. And it gets really intense if you look at the second and third trimester, but the first trimester, the reason I want to look at that one is because that is really where the argument is. That is when most people in the world, when you ask them, okay, is abortion wrong? They're like, no, women should have a right to choose. Okay, well, when do you think is uh, the time when it should not be okay? They'll say, okay, I think the first trimester is fine, but then after that, it's kind of a baby, you know? So most people believe the first trimester is the part or the time frame where it's not yet a baby. In fact, a lot of news articles will tell you it's a clump of cells. There was a photo going around. I can't remember which um, platform did it, but there was a photo going around of a supposed aborted baby. And they were like, see, it's just tissue. It's just blobs of tissue. Such a lie. That was such a lie. And so for the sake of argument, let's look at it. What exactly happens in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy? I'm going to read a little bit. It's going to come up on the screen. So we spoke about the idea of gametogenesis at fertilization. This is what happens. The baby has their own DNA. So their gender is determined, their skin colour, their eye colour, their hair colour, all of that is determined at fertilisation, at conception. Sperm meets egg, just so you didn't know. In the first three weeks after conception, the baby's backbone and nervous system is forming. Towards the end of this week, the heartbeat can be detected as early as 22 days. Many women, by the way, don't know they're pregnant yet at this point. If you don't know how a woman's cycle works, 28 days is their cycle. Unless they skip a period, they don't really figure out that they're pregnant. 22 days is when the heartbeat can be detected. So it happens often before this. At four weeks, the baby's eyes, legs and hands begin to develop. At five weeks, the child's heart is now beating rapidly. At six weeks, the baby's nose, mouth, ears are beginning to take shape and brain activity can be detected. At seven weeks, the bone formation begins and the four chambers of the heart are formed. At eight weeks, the baby now has eyelids. At nine weeks, hair follicles are forming and their fingernails and toenails are starting to develop. At 10 weeks, the baby's organs and structures are in place. The child can now swallow, close his fist and scratch his head. 
It's an image when you think about it, it's like crazy. At 11 weeks, they can turn their heads, frown, and the baby can hiccup. At 12 weeks, their toes can curl and their brain is growing rapidly. This is just the first 12 weeks when 88% of abortions occur. 88% of abortions that we know of. I think, to be honest, I think the figure is a lot less. I think more happen later on, like in the second and third trimester. People just don't report on it. It, You know, it's a corrupt world. But statistically, apparently, 88% of abortions, this is when most people think that it's okay. And so we understand what is happening. That is science. It's not my opinion. Go look it up in your own time. Now let's get a little bit deeper. What actually happens? What is the process of killing a baby in this stage? Now this is where it gets a little bit heavy. Take a breath. It's going to be good. We need to learn this stuff. Amen. So the first thing that you can do is a first trimester abortion. The first procedure you can have is what's known as the abortion pill. So you can go to the the doctor. They'll prescribe it to you. You can take it at home. Most women do it at home. What happens is they take a first pill and that pill pretty much goes in, cuts off oxygen to the baby and it starves to death. And then the second pill, they take another two rounds of pills. And the second rounds of pills is pretty much what um, produces contractions. So a woman puts it in her cheeks and she sucks on it. As she swallows it, it starts producing contractions. Her body starts contracting to expel the baby from the uterus. And so for many women, because there is so much bleeding, they sit on the toilet as this happens. And a lot of women report when they look back into the toilet bowl, they see a small, tiny baby in the toilet toilet bowl. And that's when it hits for a lot of women. Whoa, I've actually just killed a baby, not a clump of cells. And so that's the first less barbaric. And I say that in quotations because it's all barbaric. Amen. It's all ending a life, but that's a little bit less barbaric from a practical sense. The second thing that you can do, and this happens first trimester, by the way, usually happens up until 14 weeks. That's the cutoff for this type. The second type is called a suction DNC abortion. And if this is heavy for you to hear and you're like, you want to block your ears, listen up because God is going to say something to you straight after we talk about this. A suction DNC abortion. Now, for the sake of like me crying because I can't talk about this without tearing up. The team are going to put up a bit of a video. So let's turn your eyes to the screen and let's watch it. A series of metal rods called dilators like these, which increase in thickness, are inserted into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the fetus resides. The abortionist then inserts into the uterus a hollow plastic tube with a hole in it called a cannula and attaches it to suction. If the embryo is small enough, The cannula can be attached to a syringe, and manual suction alone will remove the embryo and placenta from the uterus. Otherwise, the cannula will be attached to a suction machine. The suction machine is turned on, and the abortionist slowly rotates the cannula inside the uterus. The fetus is rapidly torn to pieces as it is pulled through the cannula and tubing into a large glass bottle, followed by the placenta. Sometimes smaller embryos are pulled through intact. Occasionally, the abortionist must remove the cannula and pull out body parts that have clogged the opening to complete the abortion. Once the abortionist thinks everything has been removed, she will sometimes use a long metal curette to scrape the lining of the uterus to make sure no parts are left behind. An incomplete abortion can cause infection or bleeding. Once the uterus is empty and the bleeding is under control and all the instruments are removed, the abortion is considered complete. But before the patient leaves, the tissue must be examined to make sure the placenta and all the body parts are accounted for. Two arms, two legs, a spine, a skull. First trimester. 88% of abortions, this is what they do. If you're not seeing a dead baby in your toilet bowl, this is what's happening. And this happens at about eight weeks because at that point, it's often the baby's too big to, to do that second way. But a lot of people do it this way the whole time in the first trimester. She said herself, sometimes the baby just comes straight through the tube because it's small enough, but other times it takes a little bit of like intense suction. What happens the second trimester is even worse. See, they have to do that exact process, but because the baby is too big, the body parts are too big to go through the tube, they have to pull the limbs apart, limb from limb, and individually take them out, then crush the skull of the baby, suck out the brains, and then bring out all of the remains. And you saw she did that. That 
is terrifying that people do this. They have to inspect, make sure all of the body parts are there because if anything's left over, it could be a lawsuit. This is what happens to 88% in 88% of the abortions where people say this is what is morally okay. In the first trimester, first 12 weeks, this is okay. In fact, it's justice. It's women's rights. It's the right thing to do. What a tragedy. This is what our world has come to. That we look at something like that and this is the point. They don't show women their ultrasounds before they go in because they know as soon as you see the baby on the screen, you're like, wait, that's a being. That's a living being. And so a lot of the women don't see their ultrasounds. They're convinced out of it. Don't worry about it. It's going to make it harder. But this is the reality of our world that most people think that this is okay. And maybe you're one of the Christians that are sitting here and you're like, I can't believe you played that in church. Like, come on, church stays out of politics, right? I cannot believe you played something like that in church. We shouldn't have to see that. There are young people here. How dare you? You know what? This is so crazy because God actually speaks to Christians like this. If you're hearing this and you're like, I can't wait for this to be over. I don't want to hear it. It's too traumatic. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. This is what God would say to you because He addressed this in Leviticus. The people of God were doing a very similar practice. They were offering up child sacrifices to the false demon God. Molech. What they did is they would create a worship service, if you will. They would have instruments, the people would crowd, they would all gather in front of this big idol that they would make to this demon god Molech. They would set a fire and the mums and dads would bring their newborn baby and throw it in as an offering into the fire in order to appease the god Molech. And you're like, well, that's, that's crazy. That's a really big deal. Well, that's what women are doing now. It's just not to the false god Molech necessarily. It's to the god of convenience. It's the demonic idea of convenience and the idea of death and not life. So women are doing the same thing. It's just behind closed doors and they're just sedated and it's in white cloaks. That's all it is. It's just sterilised. It's the same evil that has happened thousands of years ago. But this is what God would have to say. See, it's not just those who were doing the evil act that God rebuked. It was actually those that watched and did nothing about it. Look at what God says in Leviticus chapter, sorry, yeah, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 20. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any Israelite or foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Molech is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I myself will set my face against him and will cut him off from his people. For by sacrificing his children to Molech, he has defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. Why? Because life is sacred. If you kill a human being, God sees it as you may as well be trying to murder him. That's how intense this is. Look at what he says in verse four. To those of you who think that it's wrong, you just don't do anything about it. If the members of the community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, and if they fail to do justice, I myself will set my face against him and his family. I will cut him off from their people together with all of those who are prostituting themselves to Molech. What God would say to you Christians is, It's not just those doing the barbaric act of child sacrifice that God will judge. God will also judge the Christians who know the law is written on your heart. You know what is right or wrong, but you choose to stand by idly and close your eyes because it's just so terrible and I can't do anything about it. So I'm going to block my ears. You know what they would do in this ceremony? It's going to come up on the screen. They would actually have instruments, specifically drums and trumpets, they would have these instruments. And as the babies were being brought over and ready to throw into the fire, the whole entire time they would be drumming loudly. Why are they drumming loudly? Well, they're trying to drown out the screams of the babies. And they're not just trying to drown out the screams of the babies, they're actually trying to drown out their conscience that when you hear a baby scream, Mothers or not mothers, fathers or not fathers, any baby, when you hear a baby screaming in pain, something in you will tell you this is not right and I have to do something about it. But the amount of Christians, you'll see because you follow the pro-life accounts on social media, you agree that life is sacred and that abortion is evil. 
But when it comes to the reality, you would never share it to your Instagram. You would never post it. When your friend from work talks to you about the one night stand she has and she just hopes she's not gonna be pregnant, if she is, she's gonna have to get, rid- get an abortion. When that happens, you kind of just listen and you, you know, hmm, I'm not gonna say anything because what's she gonna think? I don't wanna hurt her feelings. I don't wanna tell her, make her upset because if I tell anybody what, what actually happens in an abortion, what's she gonna think of me? You may not be doing the act yourself, but God is going to judge you the same way He judges those who actually commit the act. That is what that Scripture says. God cares about justice more than you do. In fact, Christian, He tells you, you are responsible. And a few weeks ago, we spoke about the fact that Australia, though it claims to be a city of revival, I've been seeing an ad online. I pray that there is revival in this country. I truly do. But we spoke about it a couple weeks ago. The reality is that this is not a land where revival happens. Why? Because only two states out of all of the states in this country, only two states have some sort of law in place that prevents, uh, that sorry, that encourages life-saving care to babies born in an abortion attempt. If a baby survives an abortion, third trimester abortion, they have to give birth to a dead baby. Sometimes the baby lives. You know, only two states in this country say that legally you have to offer life-saving care. Yet we claim that God is moving in our country and that we have revival and this is the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Two out of, two out of five is like not okay, right? Two states out of all states in this country We cannot claim that God is bringing a revival, at least not yet, because our country is producing death, not life. And so to the Christians, we have a responsibility. You may not be doing the act, but you're silent to the screams of the unborn. You don't care, or you do care, but you don't care enough to do anything or to say anything about it. You know what's so interesting is we have a friend in America His name is Seth Gruber and he has started a resistance movement against abortion and he called it the White Rose Resistance. And the reason he called it the White Rose Resistance is it's based out of a story in Nazi Germany in in 1942. A woman by the name of Sophie Scholl and her brother Hans. This was a 21 year old girl who was sentenced to death for treason because she spoke out against the Nazi regime of the time. Now this woman, this girl, she was a young girl. She was raised under the idea that socialism is great as all young people tend to do. Socialism is great, it's being propagandized and she believes it, her brother believes it, but her father, who was a devoted Christian, used to have conversations at the dinner table every night about what God says about everything that's happening and what is happening is actually anti-God's agenda and is a false agenda. And so the, the, the clocks start to tick in her head, the wheels start to turn. And then she goes to university and she sees a group of university students handing out flyers, talking about the horrors of Nazism and how what is happening is immoral. And she starts saying, "Uh, yeah, true. Something needs to be done about this. So they form what's known as the White Rose Resistance, an anti-Nazi group that was quite literally advocating against Nazism in a time where everybody just bowed down to the status quo. And we outside of that understand that was a terrible error. But inside of it, for many people, if you are truly inside of that time, would you have actually stood up and said something? Or would you have just believed it in your heart and just hope God changes it one day? This woman ended up, they ended up printing out 16 flyers. They mailed it to houses discreetly because they didn't want to go against the governing officials. They didn't want anyone to see them. They would discreetly hand out flyers. And one day Sophie just got over it. She was like, nope, I need everyone to see this. She grabbed a stack of flyers, went up to the third floor of her university and threw them out off the balcony. And they started trickling down. This is actually a famous scene. They've made movies about this in order that people would see the realities of the horror of the time. She wanted to prove how evil a time we are living in and she was willing to go against the status quo and risk her life. And you know what she said in the final days in her cell to her cellmate, a 21 year old girl, I wanna read out her words. She says, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually to a righteous cause? 
Such a fine sunny day, but I have to go. What does my death matter if through us, thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? It was because of her that thousands of people understood and woke up to the reality of the time. But the church, we shouldn't talk about politics. She says to herself, what is my death if thousands of people don't stand up to a righteous cause? The, The point of this politics series, the reason we are getting into these conversations is because for many of you, you just didn't know that that was happening. Fair enough, now you do. But for some of you, you know what's happening, you just don't wanna say anything. You don't wanna ruffle feathers. You don't wanna confront, cause you know, I don't wanna have to have the awkward conversation. I don't wanna lose friends. I don't wanna not be invited to Christmases anymore by my crazy leftist uncle. For many of you, it's cowardice. You don't wanna do anything about it. But the reason we're doing this politics series and the reason I talked about abortion tonight isn't just to convince you abortion is evil. For many of us, we know that. The reason we are doing this series, the reason we spoke about abortion is to call the church to action. You know, if you speak to someone in public, oh yeah, go to Echo Church. There tends to be a bit of a, oh yeah, I know that one. Thank God we are known that we stand against the evil culture that we live in. Thank God. But it has to start with us. 